Welcome to my garden, to the Gingy Good Earth program. I welcome you today. This is production Roman numeral 8, part 17, director Gingy Good Earth, July 21st, USA Take Love. Challenges are what make life interesting and overcoming them is what makes life meaningful. Joshua Marine. Support your armed forces. The Marines, Air Force, Space Force, Army, the Coast Guard. Go check out your local Veterans of Foreign Wars clubs and, and the American Legions and join. And that way you can keep up to date what's going on in America and live the American dream. American dream. It really does exist because we have a Constitution and a Bill of Rights and in America we have freedom but we still have the rule of law. We still have law and order. And I'm going to read a beverage out of Here's How, the Stouffer's Cookbook. And today I thought I'd go over. Let's look and see. The Gandhi, Gandhi cocktail. And here's the picture, the look and see picture of the Gandhi cocktail. There it is. Into a shaker, put one eighth ounce of grenadine, one half ounce of triple sec, one fourth ounce of lemon juice, one fourth ounce of orange juice, and one ounce of white rum. Shake with cracked ice a few seconds and strain into a California cocktail glass. And I, I pray for California's safety over there. Now the uh, book that I'm going to start reading before I read A Universal History on the United States of America where we left off, I'm going to read all about the Snake Doctor book. And it was written by 1923 by George H. Doran Company. It's called The Snake's Doctor and Other Stories. And uh, I'm just going to read a part because, you know, I worked in hospital care for many years, even at children. My first job was Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. And so... I also work for the most disabled, severe disabled disability patients. And so I've seen my gamut of human suffering. And so I just opened up the book. I read the first chapter of this book already, but I wanted to go in and just see what else is in the book. And I also have the book that was given to me but I'm going to read a part of it too. Oh yeah, I'm going to read this book. It was given to me as a gift, 1491. It's a national bestseller, New Revelations of the Americas Before Columbus. And then I did watch the Pittsburgh uh, radio station two nights ago about the um, individual that's in charge of Dorseyville American Indian organization, he gave a, an interview on a Pittsburgh radio station, and he went over Columbus and why they shouldn't name uh, football teams or baseball teams or any organizations using terminology that's uh, familiar and cherished by first Americans, and so he reviewed that, and so I want to learn more about Columbus, and that's why I didn't go into Columbus so much, but you know, the main thing is, he was 
an artisan, and navigation. And just alone to celebrate that history, Columbus had that ability. And he also had to, uh, you know, uh, proposals to the king and the queen of Spain to please allow him to adventure. And again, many adventurers from Europe came over to the Americas, according to the book, A Universal History of the United States of America. And that is something to be uh, learned that, you know, Columbus doesn't be judged for all the uh, ignorance of that time period regarding mankind because people were not educated and they were not so modern and there was a class society either you were uh, the uh, the top of the elite wealth or you were a common man and so anyhow most of us would have been a common man uh, but again, there were a lot of inventions and uh, great adventures that a man, you know, would not be able to even conceive of performing without the help of funding. And that's why the European nations funded trade and shipbuilding, and ship navigations, and, you know, again, it brought in new ideas, new products, new commerce, and so forth. And I think that uh, Columbus was not a king, and he sure, surely wasn't acting as the... Uh, you know, world headquarters for everything that was going on in North America, Asia, and all the nine continents. But again, he was, you know, basically hired to uh, provide uh, information on territory that could be seized. And the main thing that they were looking for was gold. And that's in my description in the very first videos, A Universal History of the United States of America. And we should not be putting graffiti on statues because they're pieces of art. Somebody else made that. And again, most people respect that. And, you know, today's times, ironically, there's a lot of... Uh, statues or paintings and so forth that I don't even approve of, you know, that I don't enjoy looking at. And, you know, I will tell you, my mother was an architect, she was an artist, and she was the same age as Andy Warhol. And I was there for the grand opening of the Andy Warhol Museum. And, you know, and I love his illustrations. You know, I like the actual work that he had done before his pop art. If you could think about it, pop art is pretty simplified. The, um, the hippie era, the, you know, the power to the people theme was wonderful. It, it gave uh, citizens of America more civil liberties, which they were fighting for everyone. And we do have a constitution and a bill of rights. And our nation is very unique in that than other continents because they don't have that freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and that's gold to me, okay? I'm not interested in the gold. I'm interested in, in being a participant in my community and growing in my community for success. So the things that I didn't like at the Andy Warhol was some of the um, finangled uh, New Age stuff that my mother would repeat to me, you know, that's wrong to do to a piece of work and illustrate it um, in such a way that it is disgusting, okay? Or, but it was his way of expression, and, and it, you would have to tour the Andy Warhol Museum to understand what I'm saying, because I don't even want to repeat it on here. So as much as he was modern, 
Um, he also had um, bizarre techniques in the way that he made paintings. And I'll leave it at that. And my mother's the one that reminded me of that. And I really didn't see it, but then I see that more and more as years go by. And that's truly why I like his older illustrations. And I like his, you know, Brillo box and the Campbell soup can. And, you know, I have his book on cats and I'm going to read it, you know, in one of my programs. But again, we have to think about how we're portraying humanity and civilization, because without civility and law, there would be chaos. And that is the main reason why we have to work together for peace and harmony and liberty so that we can all be a success. And we're only here for a short period of time. <clears throat> so I'm going to take a sip of coffee, and I am going to finish our people, our future, our description of Native American culture. Okay, I didn't, I didn't mean to get squirrely. And, you know, if you watch the YouTube video of You Are Free TV with Julie, she always uses the word squirrely. So I'm going to use it, too. I didn't mean to get squirrely on you. Um, I just want to express why it's important as a person to read the underline of everything so that you can have a better understanding and then, you know, it helps you realize, you know, what's nice, what's not nice, what's good, what's bad, what's hurtful, painful, and what's loving and caring. And I think that everyone should have um, that basic human understanding because I think that the majority of us want the goodness in this world. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop being squirrely and I'm going to start reading the book The Snake Doctor on page 292. And I hope you enjoy the program today. I say furthermore that the difference between your war and mine, wonder why, I'm going to speed up the slideshow. I hope it's working. I just see the same flower all the time, but okay, I might have to fix the scene, but I'm just going to go ahead and read and you enjoy the rhododendron. I'd say furthermore that the difference between your war and mine was that mine lasted so long that the folks at home got used to seeing the results of it about them. The human wreckage and all. So they're talking about the, the North and the South, the North and the South Civil War. With yours was over and ended so quick that the letdown feeling came slapping, banging when the enthusiasm was still running. High and the whole thing was still more or less of a hurrah and a novelty. I left people feeling like as if they'd spent a whole pile of money on a show and then hadn't got the worth of their money. They fussed over you a lot when you first got back, didn't they? Well, in our case, it was different. We just straggled in with our discharge papers in our pockets and went to work again. And whilst everybody here was glad to see us home again, there was no excitement. They just took us as a matter of course. Why? Gaudy, meddy, son, except among ourselves as veterans, wasn't called by our military titles as a general thing. That came later. I reckon the war had been over fully six or eight years before the run of people around here began calling me Captain Rudolph. Before that, I was just a plain Gerald Rudolph, the saddle maker. Military titles was a drug on the market then. But in the due time, us fellers that saved the Union got our paper rewards. Congress quit talking about what it was going to do for us 
and really done something. We got political recognition, and we got public offices. Some of us, and we got our pensions. Some that didn't deserve it got on the rolls, coffee coolers, and settlers, and camp followers, and the likes of that, even some deserters. There had to be abuses in the system, but the main point, I take it, was that sooner or later every deserving veteran was looked after. And you mark my words, son, in due time you boys that fought this last war will get your just desserts, too. You'll hear people going round saying that republics are ungrateful. That's a lie. Republics ain't ungrateful and they ain't ungenerous, neither. Leastwise, I'm here to testify to it that this here was not. And some of these days you'll be saying the same thing about your country that I do. You may feel different about it right now, but you won't feel so always. Of course, a feller that goes into the hero business is liable to make his mistakes, same as in any other line. For instance, if he should chance to get crippled up in a battle, the best thing he can do for his own peace of mind is just to stay right where he fell and die there and be buried there. That'll give the folks at home a chance to carve his name on a nice monument and make fancy speeches about him and appreciate his memory and all. He's no trouble to anybody any more. He's a pleasure and a pride. But if he insists on getting well and dragging himself back, maybe blind or with a timber leg or in an empty coat sleeve flapping, he's a trouble and a care. And on top of that, if he goes round looking neglected and acting reproachful, people's consciences start hurting them and they can't take it out on him, they get to disliking him because it makes them so uncomfortable every time they see him to think that maybe they're shirking their own responsibilities in the premises. I ain't blaming him so much for it, neither. It's only human nature. And nearly everybody suffers more or less from human nature. But there's one yet greater mistake you can make in this hero business. I mean, hero business. And that's the mistake of living too long. Don't live too long, son. Take my advice and don't stay on and on till the hero business quits paying its regular dividends. One tremendous hand stole out and patted his companion on his wet shoulder. It was raining outside. They were on horses on the way back home to the deep south. Don't hang on till you lose step with the procession and you pet stories get to be tiresome and folks begin calling you a pesky old nuance behind your back. Nuisance! Who wants to hear that? You maybe think it's hard on you now to look on as a burden and you're still young and healthy, but wait till you get old and back numbered and then you'll know. Gaudy Mitty, boy, you know what tis then. And yet you just now said republics ain't ungrateful. Quoth young Overstreet huskily, he wiped awkwardly at his cheek. I said it, and I say it again, answered the old man. They ain't ungrateful, but sometimes they are powerful, forgetful. Say, looky yonder, those clouds are breaking away there to the westward and raining beginning to slack off. What we say start hoofing it towards town. We can't get any damper 
than what we already are, can we? And neither one of us ain't salt nor sugar to melt away. Think you can make it? asked Mort. Well, we've still got one sound leg between the two of us, said Captain Jerry. And we can kind of hold on to one another. Come on, comrade, let's try it anyway. Don't mind me calling you comrade, do you? Buddy, was that... Buddy, buddy, was, was that we used to call a good pal over in France? Said Mort. Was it? Well... I reckon it's never too late for an old feller like me to try to be up to date. So, buddy, if you can sort of get braced yourself and then help me up on these here crookedy pins of mine, I figure we might make a start. Somewhat shaken by the effort, he finally stood upright. Why, goody, midly, he said brightly, what's a brisk little shower to a couple of old campaners? This storm ain't patching the one I remember we had down in Georgia right soon after the surrender. Them slackery red clay hills, I can shut my eyes and see them right now. And say, alongside the mud that we used to plow through over in France, that their road yonder looks to me like a paved sidewalk, said young Mort. Hang on to my arm. That's the ticket. All set, buddy. Well, then, let go. Okay, I ended at page 295, and I will be reading more from the works of Iron S. Cobb, The Snake Doctor, and other stories. And so next, I would like to go right to the big book, A Universal History of the United States of America, and we're on page 108. And usually I always backtrack. So we're going to start on page 107. In April, Brad Docked met the governors of several provinces to confer upon the plan of the ensuing campaign. Three expeditions were resolved upon. One against Du Quisin to be commanded by General Brad Docked. One against Forts Niagara and Frontenac to be commanded by Governor Shirley, and one against Crown Point by General Johnson. This last expedition was to be executed by troops raised in England and New York. New England and New York. In the spring of 1755, Washington, while busied in the highest military operations, was summoned to attend General Braddock who, in the month of February, arrived at Alexandria with 2,000 British troops. The Assembly of Virginia appointed 800 provincials to join him. The object of this army was to march through the country by the way of Wills Creek to Fort Duquesne, now Pittsburgh or Fort Pitt, as no person was so well acquainted with the frontier country as Washington and none stood so high in military fame. It was thought he would be infinitely serviceable to General Braddock. At the request of the governor and council, he cheerfully quitted his own command to act as volunteer aide de camp to that very important and unfortunate general. The army, nearly 3,000 strong, marched from Alexandria and proceeded unmolested within a few miles of Fort Pitt. On the morning of the day in which they expected to arrive, the provincial scouts discovered a large party of French and Indians lying in the ambush. Washington, with his usual modesty, observed General Braddock what sort of enemy he had now to deal with an enemy who would not, like the Europeans, come forward to a fair contest in the field, but concealed behind the rocks and trees, carrying on a deadly warfare with their rifles. Kind of reminds you of guerrilla warfare. He concluded that with begging that General Braddock would grant him the honor to let him place himself at the head of the Virginia riflemen, 
and fight them in their own way, and it was generally thought that our young hero and his 800 hearts of hickory would very easily have beaten them too, for they were not superior to the force, which, with only 300, he had handled so roughly a twelve month before. But General Braddock, who had all along treated the American officers and soldiers with infinite contempt instead of following this truly solitary advice swelled and reddened with most un unmanly rage. High times by General Braddock, he exclaimed, strutting to and fro with arms akimbo, high times, when a young buckskin can teach a British general how to fight. Washington withdrew, biting his lips with grief and indignation to think what numbers of brave fellows would draw short breath that day through the pride and obstinacy of one epauleted fool. The troops were ordered to form and advance in columns through the woods. In a little time, the ruin which Washington had predicted ensued. This poor devoted army, pushed on by their madcap general, fell into the fatal snare which was laid for them. All at once thousands of rifles began the work of death. The ground was instantly covered with the dying and the dead. The British troops, thus slaughtered by hundreds and by an enemy whom they could not see, were thrown irrecoverably into panic and confusion, and in a few minutes their haughty general, with twelve hundred of his brave but unfortunate countrymen, hit the ground. Poor Braddock closed the tragedy with great de decency. He was mortally wounded in the beginning of the action, and Washington had him placed in a car ready for retreat in a cart he was placed in a cart ready for retreat clothes on the left were the weight of the french and indian fire principally fell washington and his virginia riflemen dressed in blue sustained in lieu of the shock at every discharge of the rifles the wounded general cried out Oh, my brave Virginia blues, would to God I could live to reward your also oh gallantry, but he died. Washington buried him in the road, and to save him from discovery and the scalping knife, ordered the wagons on their retreat to drive over his grave. Oh, God, was, was that, what, what is man? O oh God, what is man? Even a thing of naught? Amidst all the fearful consternation and carnage, amidst all the uproars and horrors of a rout, rendered still more dreadful by the groans of the dying, and the screams of the wounded, the piercing shrieks of the women, and the yells of the furious assaulting savages, Washington, calm and self-collected, rallied his faithful riflemen, led them on to the charge, killed numbers of the enemy who were rushing on the tomahawks, checked their pursuit, and brought off the shattered remains of the British army. With respite to our beloved Washington, we cannot but mention here two very extraordinary speeches that were uttered about him at this time, and which, as things have turned out, look a good deal like prophecies. A famous Indian warrior, who assisted in the defeat of Braddock, was often heard to swear that Washington was not born to be killed by a bullet, for, continued he, I had seventeen fair fires at him with my rifle, and after all I could not bring him to the ground. And, indeed, whoever considers that a good rifle, leveled by a proper marksman, hardly ever misses 
its aim will readily enough conclude with this unlettered savage that some invisible hand must have turned as aside his bullets. The Reverend Mr. Davies, in a sermon occasioned by General Braddock's defeat, has these remarkable works. I beg leave to point that attention of the public to that heroic youth, Colonel George Washington, whom I cannot but hope Providence has preserved for some great service to this country. Governor Shirley proceeded in Oswego on Lake Ontario. His army was poorly supplied with provisions, and the rainy season approaching, he abandoned the expedition and returned to Albany. The army under General Johnson arrived at south end of Lake George, the latter part of August, when he received information When he received information, I'm trying to fix the picture show. Something is wrong with our picture show. So next time I'll do a better job, make sure that's, that it's going right. Okay. So Governor Shirley proceeded to Oswego on Lake Ontario. His army was poorly supplied with provisions, and the rainy season approaching, he abandoned the expedition and returned to Albany. The army under General Johnson arrived at the south end of Lake George the latter part of August when he received information that 2,000 of the enemy commanded by Baron de Caux were marching against Fort Edward. Accordingly, Colonel Williams was detached to intercept him. Colonel Williams' party, which left the camp between 8 and 9 o'clock in the morning on September 8, 1755, very unexpectedly unexpe fell in with the army of Baron de Caux. The two armies met in the road front to front. The Indians of Dyska army were in ambuscade upon both declivities of the mountains, both declivities of the mountains, and Tinus it was a complete surprise, for Colonel Williams had unhappily neglected to place any scouts upon his wings. A bloody battle ensued and a deadly fire was poured in upon both flanks. Colonel Williams, endeavoring to lead his men against the unseen enemy, was instantly shot through the head, and he and hundreds of his party, including old Hendrick, the chief of the Mohawks, and forty Indians, were slain. The remainder of the party, under the command of Colonel Whitting, retreated into the camp, they came running in, and the utmost confusion and consternation, and perhaps owed their safety in a great measure to another party, which, when the firing was heard and perceived to be growing louder and nearer, went sent out to scour them. Nor did the battle terminate the fighting of this bloody day. The remains of Deku's army retreated about four miles to the ground where Colonel Williams had been defeated in the morning. The rear of the army, where they're sitting upon the ground, had opened their knapsacks and were refreshing themselves when Captain McGinney's, who was two hundred men, had been dispatched from Fort Edward to secour the main body, came up with his portion of the French army thus sitting in security and attack and totally defeated them, although he was himself mortally wounded, thus were three battles fought in one day and almost upon the same ground. The neighboring mountain in which the French so suddenly made their appearance is to this day called French Mountain, and this name, with the tradition of the fact, will be sent down to the latest posterity. 
I was shown a rock by the road at which a considerable slaughter took place. It was on the east side of the road, near where Colonel Williams fell, and I am informed is to this day called Williams Rock. Just by the present road and in the midst of these battlegrounds is a circular pond shaped exactly like a bowl. It may be 200 feet in diameter and was when I saw it full of water and covered with a pond lily. Alas, this pond now so peaceful was the common specula of the brave. The dead bodies of most of those who were slain on this eventful day were thrown in an undistinguished confusion into this pond. From that time to the present, it has been called the Bloody Pond, and there is not a child in this region but will point you to the French Mountain and the Bloody Pond. I stood with dread upon its brink, and threw a stone into the unconscious waters. After these events, a regular fort was constructed at the head of the lake and was called Fort William Henry. Early in the spring, 1756. So I'm going to stop on page 111. And I wanted to go back and read more of Our People, Our Future. A description of Native American culture and uh, where we left off. So we, I'm just going to start. Native Americans are not primitive and uneducated. Traditional Native American values emphasize simplicity in daily living. However, that is not commiserate with primitive. Most Native Americans are educated at the secondary school level and many obtain higher education degrees at the finest universities in the United States, becoming physicians, lawyers, and college professors. I can remember attending my universities and because I was a single parent mother, I was considered a non-traditional student. <laughs> So there you go. <laughs> so if you were a single parent mother, again, you couldn't live on campus. You had to commute from your home. And a traditional student was one that lived on campus. So nomenclature, stereotyping, it's everywhere. All Native American people are not mystical, spiritual, environmentalists. Native Americans view harmony with the earth as part of the religious culture and are extremely aware of the impact actions have on environment. Native Americans view the earth as living entity, a provider. The spiritual ceremonies of Native Americans are complex and may be difficult for people outside the culture to understand. These ceremonies may seem mystical in nature because of annual timing, the use of ancient symbolism, the incorporation of the earths with the capital E, gifts, and the significant role of religious leaders. Native Americans, Indians, have made important contributions to America, history, and culture. Among these contributions are the following. Food. For centuries, Old World can countries with warm climates built empires based on abundance of grain crops. People survived and prospered through the farming of wheat, rye, barley, and oats in Europe. Rice in the east, millet in Sugum in Africa. Most Native American tribes relied on three basic crops, corn, beans, and squash. However, there were over 300 other food crops harvested in the New World, including six hands, including six kinds of corn, as well as sweet potatoes, sunflowers, wild rice, vanilla beans, coca or chocolate, a wide variety of nuts, hazelnuts. 
and many varieties of peppers. Today, 60% of the world's food is of American origin. Pennsylvania, number one industry, is agriculture. Wealth. The mining of gold and silver, largely with Native American labor, led to rapid economic development and European trade expansion resulting in the Industrial Revolution. National resources included oil, ore, water, timber, and other fuels were found primarily on Native American lands. Government. The federal system does not trace its roots to Europe, but rather to Native American tribal organizations. Both Benjamin Franklin and George Washington were extremely knowledgeable about Native American social and political structures. Franklin urged our founding fathers to model our government on the League of the Iroquois, while the United States Constitution was derived from the Iroquois, Karen Nirakulova, or Great Law of Peace. There you have it. Iroquois Nation was very much responsible for government founding of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Military service. A high percentage of Native Americans have served in American wars dating from revolutionary times until today. During World War II, for example, 400 Native American men served with the distinction as code talkers relying battlefield messages in the Athapaskan language, a language that Japanese intelligence was unable to decipher, even though they were able to interpret every other code the American military used. Code talking was so effective that it was used until 1968. The Athapaskan language almost looks like Alaska Athapaskan tongue medicines Native American Indians provided quinine as the first effective treatment of malaria and utilized many plants that have resulted in remarkable contributions to 20th century medicine including aspirin related tree bark extracts laxatives, painkillers, antibacterial medicines, petroleum jelly, and others, and the famous jopai weed. Again, jopai weed is a weed of medicinal purposes, and you can look it up on Wikipedia, and I have a music concert that's named Jopai Music Festival, and it's named after the famous Indian Yarb Man, Y-A-R-B, but herb man, and uh, to celebrate Joe Pye weed, it grows nine feet tall, it's shaped like a trumpet, it has real pretty uh, groupings of small purple-pink flowers, and it's a medicinal plant, and after the first uh, pioneer sellers, uh, settlers arrived in America, they came down with pneumonia, and this Indian herbalist introduced them to the weed and they named the weed after him and his name was Joe Pye, P-Y-E, Joe Pye Weed. And uh, that's the history on that and it's a beautiful plant and I took bundles of that and goldenrod and uh, big bundles of wheat and I used to decorate the stages with um, beautiful outdoor farming medicinal plants that are quite famous in the country farmlands that grow abundantly to decorate the stage with for the Joe Pye Music Festival. And it was very nice. So Joe Pye Weed, and I, it's in the books that I have written, uh, Honey for All and White Buffalo Spirits and Pittsburgh, Victoria, and all that it's gilded, and I have a 
whole page on Joe Pie Weed. Again, you can look up my store site. It's called Wild Trout Lily. And I make the books by hand, and they're $30 to $40 each. And I encourage you to get the book, especially on honey and how to become a beekeeper. I increased the number of beekeepers in southwestern Pennsylvania. I helped in the percentage numbers, increased it by 6%. So I taught a lot, and I taught for Penn State University, and I taught for um, St. Vincent College at the Mini, Winnie Palmer Nature Reserve, and many places, and also at the concerts that, that I held. I would give discussions on beekeeping and taught a lot of youth groups, and it was a lot of fun. Okay, so Earth Wisdom, here they have it a capital E. Earth Wisdom, Native American Indians have a fundamental respect for preserving the environment. Even as technology and growth rapidly expand our world, Earth Wisdom is a gift from the Native Americans to be embraced for future survival. Okay, so just some places to visit the Native American Center for Living Arts, Niagara Falls, National Museum of the American Indian, Smithsonian Institution, Washington, D.C., Native American Rights Fund, Boulder, Colorado, National Congress of American Indians, Washington, D.C., Pittsburgh Federal Executive Board, Native American Heritage, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, your EEO Native American Program Manager, Department of Veterans Affairs, Medical Center, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And again, one of the videos, I have over 53, I think I have over 56 videos now on Gingy Good Earth, and one of the featured videos is the original Native American then and now. I was the, the host of the video, and I interviewed Michael Muchnuck and Helene Smith, and Helene Smith wrote Apsa Uka, and she was the founder of Hannah's Town and wrote the book on Hannah's Town, and she um, was a co-author to the Pennsylvania Guide Booklet. And she wrote the book on Native American emblems with Mickey Coyote. And she wrote Eagle's Eye, the fly, you know, of Eagle's Eye. You'll have to look them up. So without further ado, I want to finish the program with gardening tips since we still have time. Many people have been planting flowers and vegetable gardens. It is a time for new plants to go into the ground. I thought you might want to include some of the following in your garden. First, it would be nice to have five rows of peas. Prayers, politeness, promptness, and peace. Next, plant three rows of squash. Squash criticism, squash indifference, and squash gossip. Then plant five rows of lettuce. Let us be friendly. Let us love one another. Let us be truthful. And let us praise the Lord and rejoice. rejoice. And no garden is complete without turnips. Turn up for meetings. Turn up with a smell. Turn up with enthusiasm. And turn up with determination. If we start planting these seeds now, we will have an abundant harvest. Teresa Rubinson. So she's the writer of that. It's very nice. And. I hope you have enjoyed today's program. And next week I want to talk about dining style with the 
South Carolina Cattle and Beef Board, and uh, I have done programming for the Dairy Council, for the Beef and Cattle Council, for the Pork Council, for the uh, Fruits and Vegetable Organizations. Again, I'm a registered dietitian of 36 years and I enjoy entertaining and delighting my audience. And I'll, I'm going to pan the, uh, the set here so you can see. And I will be adding more of my international dolls to the program. I apologize for the picture show. It wasn't as fabulous as I wanted it to be. And I have to look into it. I need to get uh, you know better equipment. And again, you can help sponsor me if you look in the description. You'll look at my, you'll see my PayPal ID number if you'd like to donate funds to help buy better equipment and to be able to have, um, you know, more uh, longer videos with better battery power. And and again, I welcome you. And we have the um, the blue flowers are wonderful and then we have the orchids the blue flowers are hydrangeas and i try to be as red white and americana red white and blue we have the irises and again if you have any questions or would like to write to me um gibson girls at mail.com and i will read over your uh, questions informationals and have a really great day. And my biggest suggestion is that you s review all the videos right from the get-go. So video number one throughout the uh, 56 videos so that you understand my objectives. And you know what? I even have time to read something out of, out of 1491. The New Revelations of the Americas Before Columbus. You know, I'm really excited about reading this because the universal history of the United States of America starts out at 1450, and so it'd be fun to see. And I bookmarked, I bookmark something. I have a thing on water. A drop in the bucket. On the average, 1,000 liters of tap water costs one dollar. That's less than the cost of a bottle of water. So, and it goes over. Uh, this is, um, I went to Arizona State. This is um, Arizona State University. What are you doing to advance sustainability in our world? And I think America and Americans have done a great amount of work to help renew 